All right, so we got some major stories developing in the last 48 hours that we need to share with you today. These are things that you're absolutely not going to hear anywhere else. My email has been blown up for the last two days asking me all about what I think about the UK possibly sending troops to Ukraine. Is it going to start World War Three? I always say we're already in World War Three. It's just a continuation of that. But there's many other stories on the same level of the one that we broke a couple days ago where we talked about how Russia is going to be conducting a nationwide full scale nuclear war drill with all the trimmings. It's going to be on that level. So please stick with me. The fact that I am liberated from circumspection on this channel that most uh, OSINT analysts are bound by, and it never ceases to amaze me. I mean, how many times do you have to be lied to by the legacy media and these talking head politicians and propagandists from both sides of the spectrum until you stop being surprised when their actions are incongruent with their words? At this point in time, people should be speculating, not wild, irrational speculations, but well within the realm of plausibility. That is what we're going to do here today. We're going to talk about what might happen in the next 45 days. What is happening right now? All right. So right now it appears as though there is a NATO meeting taking place in Lublin, Poland. Apparently this is a secretive meeting and a lot of the OSIN gatherers are uh, alluding to flight radar and the planes from the German Air Force, Italian Air Force, Spanish Air Force, French, Netherlands, Ireland, Greece, Czech Republic, United States, just to name a few converging on this one place in Lublin, Poland. What are they talking about? Is this just a wargaming exercise or is this a planning for a future exercise? Was this a pre-planned exercise? As far as they know, there wasn't any pre-planned exercises in this region. So is this possibly a prelude to some sort of Article 4 scenario? The invocation of Article 4 is when all the NATO countries convene a meeting to decide whether or not they're going to take it to the next level of Article 5. Immediately, if NATO goes to Article 4, Russia goes on a higher state of nuclear readiness than it is right now. I'm not sure how much higher it can go, but the threat of accidents drastically increases. It might even invite some sort of a preliminary attack from the Russians on NATO bases in anticipation that there's going to be an impending full-scale war with NATO. That could be why I suspect that these Article 4, Article 5 formalities are just sort of there on the surface. They don't really mean much. I think that if NATO was going to have an uh, Article 4-like meeting, they would do so in secret. They would do it discreetly off the books so not to trigger that sort of attention from Russia. Now, I'm not saying what this is, but understand, in the last 48 hours, a lot has happened that's got a lot of people worried, and we're going to try to demystify and, and parse it all out. What's happened in Romania is very concerning. Why do the Russians continue knowing that they are on the borderlines with their attacks on the ports in Ukraine, the constant uh, bombs and uh, drones that are falling on the Romanian side of the Danube River? You think that they would relent on those attacks by now if they knew it could trigger Article 5. What we are seeing here is NATO being tested. Their resolve is being tested. Clearly, there are Shahid drones and missiles falling in Romanian territory now almost on a nightly basis. Okay, the air raid sirens, the air alerts, the emergency messages are being sent out to civilian phones there almost on a daily basis. So is this uh, this uh, convening of this meeting of NATO, is this to discuss some sort of preliminary to Article 4? Because you know eventually it is coming. The fact that Russia is, is really willing to skirt the line of failure that close is telling you that NATO is willing to fight the Russians conventionally in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and that maybe the Russians are calling their bluff in some respect. In addition to that, you have this story about the UK possibly sending troops to Ukraine. Now, let's debunk that a little bit. They're not sending troops to Ukraine. Rishi Sunak didn't walk anything back either, for those of you who are keeping up with this story. 
What they're saying is that they're going to start training Ukraine troops instead of training them in the UK, where they're going to be getting 50 F-35s with nuclear weapons very soon. They're going to do it in Ukraine. They're going to train troops in Ukraine in the same way that you have American uh, troops in there right now, I think since last year. They, they're doing auditing, maintenance, and I think they're even probably doing some training of Ukraine troops there as well. So this has been ongoing. Um, now, what will likely happen, there's numerous scenarios that NATO then has to engage the Russians. And it's very important that we pay attention in the next 45 days, because I think somewhere smack dab in the middle of that 45 days, there is going to be a massive provocation because support for Ukraine is undoubtedly waning in numerous countries. Now, people are talking about Slovakian uh, president. Is it president or prime minister? I don't know. A new pro-Russian Slovakian president. All I'll say for that, whenever you hear that there's a new European leader who is pro-Russia or this and that, and that country has contracts to get American weapons, keep that in mind. The same thing happened with Italy. Everybody thought Meloni was going to, you know, be more pro-Russian in her stance. But they all want F-35s. They all want American weapons. And if they don't toe the line, the Americans will just scrap those contracts or not deliver or not prioritize those contracts. And they won't get those weapons. And even that, even so, uh, the Slovakian uh, country of 5.5 million people was providing paltry military assistance to Ukraine anyways. So it's kind of redundant, but indeed there's been a few losses for Ukraine in the last 48 hours. Uh, the most notable one, of course, is the lack of increased spending, emphasis on increased spending to avert a government shutdown in the United States. They're still going to be getting all the aid that has been previously promised, they're just not going to be getting any additional stuff, at least not for 45 days. Now, throughout this 45 days, I propose to you that we might see some sort of Gulf of Tonkin incident. And the stage is being set up in the Black Sea for that very thing. Is it at all a coincidence that on the day that that was announced, on the day, pretty much on the hour it was announced, you have the UK coming out and saying, we're going to send Typhoon jets to Poland to protect against the Russian threat. Okay, we're going to send troops into Ukraine to train uh, Ukrainian troops. And they also said that they're considering putting their fleet, their actual Navy, into the Black Sea, whether or not Turkey allows it. It's another story. But all of those things, the trifecta, okay, air, land, and naval, committing all of that loosely or threatening it, you could say, on the same day that uh, the Americans seemingly are starting to wane in their support for Ukraine. But really, like I said, it's not. It's just a stopgap. But we're going to see what happens in the next 45 days because <clears throat> I think a variety of things that could happen, just like they did in the Gulf of Tonkin incident, that eventually got the Americans into the Vietnam War, you very well could see something like that happening. And it may happen around the grain corridor in the delivery of uh, Ukrainian grain through this now non-existent humanitarian corridor that the Russians say it's now open season on Ukrainian grain ships. What happens if one of those grain ships gets targeted? What happens if the U.S., like they're talking about today, or the U.K., or Bulgaria, or Romania, what if one of their warships that are currently battling uh, Russian warships on a fifth-generation hybrid warfare front with GPS, electronic warfare, what happens when there's an exchange there? Okay, What happens when one of those ships mysteriously gets sunk or is claimed to have been sunk or is claimed to have been fired on? That's when you're going to get an event. It's very, I think that the, the time is right for an incident like that, for a Gulf of Tonkin, Tonkin, geez, I can't even speak today. You know, it's Sunday, a Gulf of Tonkin-like incident in the Black Sea. Because if you need at this point in time, either a, a, a variety of things could happen, okay? You need either a new offensive, the Ukrainians are talking about, and remember I said this months ago, they're talking about a new offensive to seize the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Why? Because that's where the Russian defenses are most minimal. 
Now, and, and recently, in just the last couple days, mysteriously, not surprisingly, but, you know, this is concerning, that, uh, is it Raphael Grossi, the head of the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, they did some sort of UN resolution that commanded, even though they have no army to back it up, that the Russians basically forgo the nuclear power plant, that they hand it back over to the Ukrainians. Now the Americans are uh, suggesting, <clears throat> or according to Russian media outlets citing undisclosed sources, that the Ukrainians are planning a new offensive in and around the Kyrgyzstan or Zaporozhia region, specifically centered around the nuclear power plant. And this makes the most sense uh, if they are, or this could just be, you know, uh, misdirection. It's hard to say because they are making, they continue to make headwind in the uh, headway in the uh, Verbov direction, but uh, not enough to placate a lot of the critics in the U.S. and the West, and certainly not uh, the Russian critics as well. But we might see a new offensive. That's one thing we might see in the next 45 days to try to gin up more support for this war. We may see some kind of false flag provocation, Gulf of Tonkin-like thing in the next 45 days. We may see some sort of provocation. Would this be an attack on a Russian nuclear facility with these drones that the Ukrainians are engineering more and more of? The ranges are getting long and longer. They've already boasted about uh, drones with a thousand kilometer range, which would allow them to reach St. Petersburg. Is there going to be some sort of massive provocation? I believe Zelensky was just talking about an incursion into Russian territory once again. Is there going to be a massive incursion using Western weapons so to provoke a major response by the Russians? Or are we going to see another massacre situation that is going to uh, in in encourage the West to provide more support to Ukraine? According to the RAND report that was released recently, they claim, and this is an American corporation, I do believe, American, possibly British uh, in origin, but uh, they go back a, a long ways with the military industrial complex. Anyways, one of their primary concerns uh, in a way that the, this could go to the nuclear level is if NATO elements within Ukraine, okay, within Ukraine are killed and targeted, be they inspectors, be they trainers, be they people who are auditing the weapon systems or whatever the case might be that this might trigger. Now, because these guys are there covertly, I'm pretty sure they know that, you know, if they die, there's not going to be any immediate reprisals because they're there covertly. But that is one concern of the RAND report is that if they start to open NATO based weapons manufacturing facilities in Ukraine, as well as sending non-troops, kind of half troops there to just train troops, which are probably going to be helping in certain other aspects as well, then that could be one of the things that trigger a major escalation. Of course, what's going on in Romania along the Danube River, where night after night you have uh, civilians getting alerts on their phone saying that they have to uh, head to the newly built bunkers there, which is just insane. You know that the Russians are calling NATO's bluff. In Romania, why would they continue persistently targeting these ports, knowing that a lot of these drones are falling into Ukrainian territory? Something else is going on there. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Obviously, it's because a lot of the, uh, they would suspect that a lot of the, and at least this is what it might be on its face. This is the the topical explanation: is that they would presume that the weapons are coming in through these ports, and so that every once in a while there's going to get one of these drones that, that goes over into Romania. Now, are these drones being hacked? Are they being uh, jammed with electronic warfare? And maybe there's some Ukrainian elements that are sending them over the border, hoping that that would be the provocation needed for NATO to enter the conflict. Because why would Russia continue knowing? I mean, Russia doesn't want NATO directly involved in this war. Or maybe they do. Because remember, and I've, I've all, often quoted this guy, he, he's no longer with us, uh, Peter Vincent Price said that it is perhaps possible 
that NATO, knowing they could, or sorry, Russia, knowing that they could potentially defeat NATO in a conventional land-based war, remember Russia's, uh, what do they call it? Russia's an elephant and the United States is a whale. So yes, in a naval-based war, the United States would likely win. It depends on how you look at it. it, depends on what weapons you're sort of bringing into that calculation. But in a ground-based war, the Russian war machine is just firing on all engines. And NATO can't keep up, at least not yet, until we turn on the printing press uh, in terms of weapons manufacturing. At least right now, Russia has this largely outgunned. So is Russia, with this whole Ukraine thing, is this like their Spanish civil war of sorts that Germany had, where they're trying to uh, goad us into a conflict that we can't win, where they're trying to uh, replicate the whole Austerlitz type maneuver that Napoleon, where he feigned weakness and invited an attack and uh, they were prepared to counterattack with overwhelming force. Is that what Russia is trying to do? Does Russia want NATO in this conflict? Is the question, is Russia testing the limits? Are they really going to support a smaller country like Romania or uh, Slovakia? Well, not Slovakia. We'll talk about them in just a minute. Uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Is NATO really going to put it all on the line for these small countries? Probably not. And Russia knows it. What is NATO going to do? They're going to send some AWACS planes to monitor the border along the Baltic countries. They're going to send some reconnaissance planes. They're going to send a few HIMARS in here and there. But only if you play ball and you continue to send weapons to Ukraine. That's why this whole Slovakia business about, oh, it's a pro-Russian president now, it's all bluster in my personal opinion. It, it, never mind the fact that it's a country of 5.5 million and the aid that they provide Ukraine in the first place is paltry. But the fact, paltry relatively speaking, actually not relatively speaking, but compared to like what a country like United States is uh, providing Ukraine or the EU as a whole, Slovakia, if they want weapons, just like any other EU country, if they want those F-35s, and the fighting vehicles and the tanks and the artillery from the Americans, then they have to play ball. It's as simple as that. They get cut off, those contracts get torn up. So a lot of these countries, I think, you know, they get in running on that platform and then they get in and they realize, oh, this is why. And this is why, you know, even the Russians know, even if Trump gets in or whoever gets in, the war rhetoric is gonna continue all the same because we've talked at length for the grand macroeconomic reasons as to why the war must persist. Let's see what the markets do on Monday. If the markets go up, because it's probably going to go up because the government shutdown was averted, but you just never know at this point in time. Um, but if the markets start to tank a lot, it could be because either the Russians have effectively established himself in that region of the world and now magnified their potential, their gross domestic product potential, their population potential. Medvedev says they're going for more territories, that they're likely going to take all of, you know, eastern parts of Ukraine. So we're going to have to see what the markets do anyways. But there's all of these possibilities, okay, um, there's all of these possibilities for a major event to happen in the next 45 days to galvanize more support for the conflict. I am very concerned that we get a proverbial October supplies, surprise in uh, the next few weeks. Unless, you know, something big is about to happen in the next couple days with all of this nuclear war preparation business and these meetings happening in uh, Lublin, Poland. Who knows what that's about? Again, it could just be a military exercise but right now you got Serbia with two or three brigades on the border they say don't worry we're turning it all around well that's the same thing that Russia said before the war started you cannot believe a thing these people say it just never ceases to amaze me how the OSINT crowd continues to take all these things on the surface take them at face value never take what they say at face value doesn't matter if it's a propagandist on your favorite side or the other, or legacy media, alternative media, always leave a bit of wiggle room there, and you are free to speculate a little bit at this point in time. That doesn't mean that you run with it, but we are honestly left to our own devices with this. There is a secret war going on in the background, and what we're seeing on the surface 
is not, you have to understand that there's back channel communications. There's a whole other dimension of this war. Like we're seeing it in 2D, but the leaders in the world, they see it in 3D. They understand the strategic battle that is going on without it actually being a battle in the background. Case in point, I was sent an email the other day. I didn't realize this was happening, but this is a, a major concern. We talked about the prospect for a war to flare up <clears throat> in the Black Sea with a Gulf of Tonkin-like incident with the GPS jamming of the Romanian Navy by the Russian Navy there. Well, get a load of this. Apparently, there was GPS interference testing in Fort Carson, Colorado. Okay, and this is a... This is a disclosed by the U.S. government. You can't quite see it there, but this was openly disclosed by, uh, I guess it would be the U.S. Air Force who did this, the Federal Aviation Administration, okay? And this was an email I got sent by somebody who clearly knows what they're talking about. I can just tell by the jargon that they use. The U.S. military is currently jamming satellite communications over Fort Carson, Colorado, Cheyenne Mountain, Cheyenne Mountain, you know that uh, notorious Cheyenne Mountain, that's the place where they used to likely would have gone in case of a nuclear war, but nowadays they likely have 50 different deep underground military bases that we don't know about that are dug so damn deep. Anyways, if you don't believe that that's the case, just understand that it happened that there was secretive nuclear bunkers in the past, and if you don't think that that's the case right now, then you're very naive. Anyways. They call it GPS jamming, but it's really GLONASS jamming, which is the Russians' version of GPS, okay? GLONASS jamming to interfere with ICBM satellite navigation systems. Jamming exercises could easily be moved from one frequency band to another, along with signal wattage during the output phase, along with antennas. Just a matter of calibrating the equipment from GPS frequencies to GLONASS frequencies. So he's saying, that they're currently running these jamming uh, exercises on GPS, but to do so in GLONASS would just be a matter of changing the frequency. Why would you want to do this? Well, it's that third dimension I've been talking about, the cyber dimension, the hybrid war dimension that the, the uh, powers that be get briefed on from an intelligence perspective, but we, the population, don't see. There is a war going on in the shadows. It's a spy versus spy scenario it is this type of thing going on in the background it's nuclear submarines uh, chasing nuclear submarines you know there's a lot of things going on that we don't see that really do dictate whether or not this goes full-blown nuclear at any given time so that they are trying to do this means that they're trying to find a way to completely disable russia's ability to effectively target ICBMs get them to the, their destination. Now, all that really would mean, I presume, is that if they launched them and uh, they weren't hacked or they, weren't, they didn't have that uh, stifled by uh, electronic warfare means, then they would just hit in other places or maybe they fall into the ocean. Who knows what happens? I guess the idea is so that they're Im more imprecise and that they can't effectively target, especially the military bases and uh, places of critical interest, critical infrastructure. But that's very interesting. And this just happened on September 28th and 29th. Now, UK is going to deploy RAF fighter jets to Poland. I got in an argument with somebody today on Twitter when, uh, I don't know, they were saying something about how the, the usual stuff, like, you know, the Russian Air Force would get the floor wiped with them with the U.S. Air Force and blah, 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 blah. And while I agree that the U.S. Air Force has the privilege of being able to train and train and train, there's a big difference between a simulation in which you know, between a simulation and real world when you know that you're going to die, Okay. Are American troops, are they ready for that level of uh, those attritional rates, those casualty rates, knowing that there's a very, very high likelihood, like when a Russian goes into battle, there's like a one to three chance he's not going to make it out. Typically, I think in American fought wars, and this is not throwing shade on Americans, we're in the same boat together, 
uh, and not and certainly not Americans in general. You guys aren't the Amer American, you aren't the military industrial complex. So don't Karen out on me and think that I'm targeting you. I'm talking about the military industrial complex, okay? Um, it's very different to be in a war and have the, th the threat, the knowing that there's a very high likelihood that you're going to die in your performance under those conditions, then in even the most stress inoculation training simulation scenario that uh, you could undergo in this type of military style training. So yes, indeed. And a lot of things, you know, the movies like Top Gun and stuff like that, I don't think it's gonna be a lot of dogfighting. There's been a few dogfights in this war between Russian and Ukrainian forces, but by and large, it's just been planes getting shot down with air defense and they're just flying under the radar sortie, stuff like that. So, you know, it's very unlikely that it would just be this, this full-scale dominance that a lot of people envision if America was to go to a conventional war with the Russians. Would they likely be able to overwhelm the Russians because they have thousands more planes? It's very possible. But this is why Russia over the years has cultivated its missile defense. So these are just things to keep in mind. Anyways, on the same day that uh, Biden uh, wasn't able to uh, lock in that funding for Ukraine, all of a sudden, Rishi Sunak and friends are there, just like Boris Johnson. Remember when back in the beginning of the war, when Turkey almost had brokered a deal between the Russians and the Ukrainians to bring a stop to the war. I can't remember exactly what it was going to be or what the details of the deal were. Boris Johnson takes a flight. Well, I don't know if he flew there. He probably could have flown there at that time. Anyways, he went to Ukraine, turned it all around. So you can see that it's, the, it's elements within the UK, within NATO, within the big player countries that are trying to keep this thing going. And even Germany, a uh, member of their parliament there said, not only are we going to send Taurus missiles, she said the quiet part out loud, but we also need to authorize them to attack targets within Russia. Remember, this is tiptoe. This is mission creep. They're not going to do it all at once. They have to be very, very careful that they don't elicit that dreaded nuclear response from the Russians. Okay. According to Grant Shapps, he held talks with the army commanders about moving the formal UK-led training program to Ukraine rather than relying on bases in the UK and other NATO members. He also called for more British defense firms to set up factories in Ukraine. Now think about this for a second. Think about this. How is it possible that they're going to have weapon manufacturing factories in Ukraine unless they're way underground? Like think about that. And why would they do that in the first place if they're just going to be targeted by the Russians unless unless their air defense is sufficient to protect these places, and then this calls into question, well, maybe Russia doesn't have the capability. They're not going to risk putting these weapons manufacturing facilities in Ukraine unless they can guarantee nobody's going to invest in that. Why would you invest in something? How are you going to, you know, how are you going to get investors, number one? How are you going to get it insured, knowing that there's a very high likelihood that it's just going to be wiped off the map? Well, unless they have a very high level of confidence that that is not going to happen. So this is the sneaky stuff I'm telling you guys about that, you know, that indicates where this conflict is going, that it, it's almost a given now that if they're building these weapons manufacturing facilities there, either they're going to form some sort of coalition and Poland is going to go in there and take Western Ukraine, as a lot of people have been speculating they're going to do for the last year or so. Um, but they wouldn't do this unless there was some sort of guarantee. Why would they do it? Just so the you know, Russians could take it out and they could say, oh, see, you know, the Russians you know, took it out. Well, what did you expect was going to happen? Unless they're doing it intentionally to provoke the Russians into taking it out so NATO can say, oh, look, you killed some uh, members of Western countries. I don't know. Either way, you know, it appears as though the Taurus missiles are en route. It's only a matter of time and Biden came out you know that very day and basically said look I don't have the exact I think I actually do have the exact quote that he said here today but it was something to the effect of we cannot relent in our support for Ukraine and that it's going to continue unabated by and large and uh, it makes me think that man they are getting they're getting desperate something somebody's trying to hide something there 
You know, who knows what is going on unless it really truly is just a simple matter of them not wanting Russia to gain a greater sphere of influence. And that's probably what it is. You know, we must continually understand that if Russia absorbs the better part of Ukraine and let's say 10 million of their inhabitants, they get the Black Sea, they get all the resource rich, industrially rich land that's rich in uh, minerals, that's rich for agriculture, they get to absorb all that into their economy, into their already, you know, sizable economy in terms of raw materials and natural resources anyways. And it really would make them an economic powerhouse. It's arguable that they'd be a far bigger economic powerhouse, just like North Korea, were it not for the copious amounts of sanctions levied against them by the West. But again, that is another story. Here we go. Nuclear Medvedev is saying that Russia will occupy all the original Russian lands in Ukraine, likely Donetsk, Lugansk, Zaporozhia, Kherson, Odessa, Kharkiv, the list goes on. They're going for it all now. And uh, Ukraine is, I'm sure there's people panicking in Ukraine. <clears throat> I don't think they should because I don't think, I just think that this is an inflection point. Some people think this is a turning point in the war. I think this is an inflection point. Remember what NATO has been saying for the longest time. NATO has been saying, you know, counterintuitively to the rest of us with half a brain, that if Russia takes over Ukraine, then we're going to get nuclear Armageddon in World War III. They say that because that means that they believe that Russia is going to continue into the Baltics, into Poland, that Poland is going to have to go to war with Russia. But those of us with a little bit of common sense would have said, wait a minute, wouldn't, you know, if, if Russia views Ukraine as a part of them, as historical part of them, and I'm not saying this is true, I don't know enough about the history, you know, to, to have an opinion on this, but if they view it as an existential risk to their country, losing that country. Doesn't that escalate into nuclear war before the other way? Now, obviously, again, you can't believe a thing that these people say. So it's very likely they're just saying that in order to garner more support for the conflict. Anyways, according to many people within the U.S. government and the Ukrainian government, the absence, the absence of provisions for aid to Ukraine in recent and the recent U.S. stopgap bill could not be construed as a, as a change in the nation's support for Ukraine. There are no changes regarding support for Ukraine. There are also very important agreements regarding joint work on the creation of weapons production facilities in Ukraine. So you have this whole clown world military industrial complex thing. Zelensky met with all the big weapons manufacturers the other day. And you notice they always shoot it in 24 frames per second, which is standard Hollywood. You know, if you, if you don't know what that looks like, it's that cinematic look. It's not as sharp colors. If you look at 60 frames per second, that's what the eye really is comfortable with. Uh, but they shoot it in 24 frames per second to make it look like a cinema. And they have all these weird cinematic angles, like you're watching a movie or something. Why do they do that? It just, you know, eventually people are going to start cluing in as to the inauthenticity of it. Anyways, so... You know, what can I say? You know, the shit's hitting the fan. Russia is jamming NATO ally with electronic warfare. Well, of course they are. Because now Romania is on the border there with their air defense, threatening to shoot down Russian Shahid drones as they come into the ports. That is very likely that Romania and the United States are sending weapons through these ports. So, of course, they're going to do this. Of course, this is how war is going to flare up. You have all these countries talking about how they're going to start putting their navies in the Black Sea now. Now, I'm not sure if that's going to happen any time soon. But if they did, that would be a massive escalation. The former commando, commander of NATO forces in Europe, retired Admiral of the U.S. Navy James Stavridis, stated that the U.S. and NATO countries can accompany grain ships in the Black Sea and open fire on Russian Navy in case of a threat. Okay. Let's see what happens, I guess. I was talking about how the Slovak army, they still want to buy all of the weapons and stuff from the USA. So, you know, just like all of the other uh, guys who everybody thought was anti-Russian, they're going to fold as well. It's, you know, I, I don't see support. People are saying that there was an anti-war protest 
in Poland, hundreds of thousands of people, but it wasn't. It was just an opposition to the current government. That opposition party is still very pro-Ukraine, and I don't think the support uh, for the Ukraine war is going to wane, especially in Poland anytime soon. So be very careful about how things are framed on Twitter and other social media platforms. Speaking of social media, guess what? As predicted, Justin Trudeau is coming for yours truly. Social media streaming services, and the reason why they're doing this, as we approach zero day, they want to have full control of the media so they can control the narrative, so they can tell you who's the bad guy and who's the good guy, right? So you can't use your own discernment to try to figure that out. The CRTC, I can't remember exactly what that stands for, Canadian regulation of the content, something like that. CRTC has announced which types of services it will regulate under the Online Streaming Act. All online services with audio or video content, including social media that meet a certain revenue threshold in Canada, will have to register with the Federal Broadcast and Telegram Regulator, which means YouTube. They're not talking about individual podcasts. They're going to make it harder for these social media platforms. So who knows how they're going to try to strong arm them in the background so that they can have the control over what people see. The CRTC said in a decision Friday afternoon that its new regulations mean various online undertakings that broadcast audio and audiovisual content that is intended to inform, enlighten, or entertain. I wonder about educate. What about educate? Maybe we'll start being an education channel. Those buzzwords must be registered with the commission. Everything must be commissioned in the Orwellian future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Russian gas production. This is concerning for me. Russian gas production collapses to late stage USSR levels. Not good. Again, you know, if you keep pushing Russia, if you, you know, if their economy cannot sustain, which I think it probably can because they have the help of China and numerous other countries, but if they can't, that's when they have fewer and fewer options, and that's probably why there is a lot of activity at their nuclear testing site in Novaya Zemlya right now, like a lot. Not only there, but also in Nevada and in uh, their counterpart in China. Okay, so they're getting ready to do nuclear tests, full-scale nuclear testing. It's coming back. So just get ready. Don't be surprised. You know, it, it's one thing to try to be objective and not make these speculative sort of claims that I do, but don't be surprised if you're an OSIN gatherer when what they're doing is incongruent with what they say. Do not be surprised. If you're still surprised at this point, you got object permanence issues or something like that, okay? You know, we released a couple videos over the weekend um, that, as per usual, they, you know, the most applied preparedness information, the most practical, actionable stuff never gets the attention. And I understand, and it's something that I've just accepted at this point in time that, you know, our core audience is going to appreciate those videos that we put a lot more time and effort into. Not that this, this takes a lot of time and effort to trust me. I rack my brain all night to think it's not just about, you know, parlaying information to you guys. It's sharing a, a unique uh, analytical twist on things like tonight, you know, whether or not we're going to see a false flag in the next 45 days, something to think about. But Indeed, I would encourage people to just watch our other content. Uh, you know, a lot of these are, we do have products in them, and I always try to deliver a little bit of an educational value in addition to. So we talked in a recent video about this brand new, if you guys know Jorge Sprov, the Slingshot channel, you know, he's made a lot of cool stuff. This is a brand new innovation. The Siege Crossbow platform is not new, but the magazine, for the Siege is new. They had the magazine for the recurve version that was the Adder, but this is brand new. And what it is, basically, I don't have an arrow in there, do I? Basically, it's a fast caulking, auto loading. You can put seven arrows in here. You can even have speed loaders. It's a very, and it's high powered. That's why it's actually practical. You're getting 320 feet per second. Some guy said, well, I got compound bows or compound crossbows that can go 450 feet per second. Well, yeah, you're not going to get everything in one platform. It's not going to be the fastest, most powerful, auto-loading, you know, first of its kind, fast-cocking. Come on. You got to have some 
concession somewhere else this thing would be twice as big and it's small too like relatively speaking it's lightweight so i was thoroughly impressed i've shot hundreds of arrows through this thing in our testing and i'm just it's very cool why would you want a crossbow for stealth even you ak guys and you ar-15 guys and like me a tavor guy you still got to have something for stealth hunting you don't want to be drawing a lot of attention sometimes this you won't hear it from you know 20 30 yards away and uh, we also did a video on both of these products these uh, gear review videos that we did over the weekend were premier vi exclusive you know video releases brand new products the extra large harvest right freeze dryer is just you know it's incredible it's an incredible machine it's incredible to see how far harvest right has come in all these years it's almost flawless there was a time when Harvest Right first came out where you had to change the oil and was a pain in the ass and the software wasn't the greatest. It worked, but it required a lot of tinkering. Now it's turnkey. It's just, it's uh, plug and play. Essentially, you don't have to change the oil every 25, every 25 to 30 batches, you change the oil, but even that process has been greatly simplified. The machine works flawlessly. You can freeze dry copious amounts of food with this thing. But that's across the board. All of their new freeze dryer line, whether it's medium, large, or extra large, they all function on that level. It's not just the extra large, but you see, I had the old version from like six or seven years ago that I've been using all these years. And then they, we got this new one in here and I ordered, I think we ordered about 15 of them in. We ordered one for the shop because of course we want to use it. But I think over half of them have already gone. So if you want one, get one at canadianpreparedness.com. And I would encourage you to watch the video just to kind of learn a bit about the process. Um, freeze drying is a luxury. This is not something that you learn about prepping and you go out and buy right away. Most people will never buy or need to buy a freeze dryer. It might be something that has practical utility in your life. By and large, most people are gonna be just fine storing away their rice and beans and other staple grains. We've done countless videos on that. There's ways to prep on the cheap. And that's what you do first. When I first started prepping, what is it about 13, 14 years ago, the first thing I did, because I was broke. I was broker than a joke at that time. First thing I did, I think I went, I bought a recurve bow. I bought uh, some cheap Rambo knife off of Amazon. I didn't know nothing about knives at the time. I bought uh, lots of beans, rice, mylar bags, put it in the closet. You know, that's the first thing I did. And I just started gradually building on things. You don't want to break the bank right away unless, as we're going to talk about in the coming days, you know that you only have a few days left and you, you have a high degree of confidence. That's when you want to blow your wad. And blow your wad, I mean max out the credit cards. We're not there yet. I'll be sure to let you know. Well, actually, I won't because there's always a liability for financial advice. But there might come a time when, yeah, it makes sense to go into debt to prepare. I don't think we're there yet. Um, you know, I would not advise. But I will say that if you are going to go into debt for season tickets to the Lakers or for a big screen TV, you're much better off if you have to choose going into debt between something you can use and actually you know, give you some peace of mind and security, uh, aside just some other frivolous purchase that you don't really need that's not gonna bring a, a whole lot of value to your life over and above uh, you know, more pixels or whatever, then consider preparedness. But I'd encourage you guys, check out those videos that are not Daily Dose of Doom and Gloom related because we're getting out of crunch time, man, and uh, it, it's proof positive why most people just really aren't gonna survive, <laughs> to be honest. Even people who watch the channel, because most people just wanna, you know, they just want the information, which I totally get, but uh, you, you have to also be doing stuff. You gotta be doing stuff, man. And uh, even though those videos cost us way more than they ever bring in in terms of revenue, I learn in doing those videos and that's the greatest reward for me is the learning factor. You know, when we go out and we build a, an off-grid bunkie with my buddy Dean, I learned so much, even though that video cost me so much to make, you know, I learned so much in that process. So that's valuable to me. But anyways, let me know what you think about this. What do you think is gonna happen in the next 45 days? 
and stay tuned because we have a very special video coming in the next couple days, what to do in the first 24 hours of a nuclear war. Stay tuned.